let's see the command that Jesus gave to his followers. So come with me, if you may, to Matthew chapter 28, the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 28, and I'll be reading from verse 16, what has been termed the Great Commission. And that commission was not just to the immediate followers of Jesus, the disciples who later on became the apostles, but it is in effect to all of us. Someone say it is to all of us. Hallelujah. So Matthew chapter 28, verse number 16 to the end from the New Living Translation. From the New Living Translation. The Bible says, then the 11, the 11 disciples, remember that Judas is not with them anymore. So the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority. People love power. People love authority, don't they? But over here, the one who is the embodiment of authority is speaking to us. And he lives in you. He lives in me. And we're going to have to follow and obey the the. the the words that he's going to give to his immediate disciples, which in effect will also be something that we have to obey. So he says here, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, therefore, go. Now that is where the problem comes. Jesus is saying we must go, and we are saying they must come. (laughs) <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we often want them to come, but Jesus said, we must go. And if we're going to go, that's when we can bring them in. But we often sit and relax, and we just want them to come. But the first command that we've got to obey is go in. Someone say, go in. Go in. Therefore, go and make. In other words, go and manufacture. Go, go and, if there's an, a, a certain degree of intentionality. We cannot wish them saved. Wishing them saved is good, but we've got to do something about wishing them. Or, 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 or um, um, Next week we'll learn about the things that we've got to do before we share our faith. One of which, or the first among them, is prayer. But we say that you can't go, no one can go into the strong man's house and plunder his house unless they first do what? They bind the strong man. And so we'll talk about that next week, God willing. So he says, therefore, go and make disciples of what? All nations. And that's what I love about what we have as a church. You know, I've often said that I cannot see myself pastoring a uh, uh, monoculture, a mononational kind of a, a church. I love what is, and this has to be a good representation of what we will see in heaven. Hallelujah. When Joel had his revelation, he saw people from every kindred and every nation, every tribe. And that's what God is looking for. And over here in the Great Commission, he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them, teach these, teach these new disciples to obey, not just for them to hear, but for them to what? Obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always. I was expecting more amens and hallelujahs. I am with you. During your tough times, during your good times, or whatever times, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hallelujah. Even to the end of the age. May the Lord bless the reading of his precious holy word. B, B, would you give me a glass of water? Warm, thank you. Hallelujah. And so we're going to look at what type of an, an, an evangelist are you? So if Jesus is giving this command and he's giving it to them and it's in effect, to all of us, then all of us must have our style of relating and sharing the gospel with other people. By the way, what is the meaning of evangelism? It might look like a big word and a funny pronunciation, but evangelism simply means the spreading of the Christian gospel. What is the meaning of the gospel? What is the meaning of gospel? Good news. 
Good news. Okay? So next time you and I are sharing the good news, we must make sure that we get, up, we get rid of all our bad news. <laughs> Amen? Amen. We will we'll learn something about how Paul uh, um, used uh, words and, and opportunities. Okay? But the gospel is good news, and the good news is Jesus came to save us. Jesus came to forgive our sins and to redeem us. Someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Good news. Carry good news with you. If that good news has been a blessing to you, then share it with others. How many of, how many of you will say that we've got enough bad news? <laughs> so the world doesn't need more bad news. Amen. It is your job and my job to share the good news about Jesus Christ. So the evangelism, by definition, is the spreading of the gospel uh, by public preaching or personal witness. And personal witness is very, very important. You can't just say that I'm pointing you to Jesus, but don't look at me. <laughs> Amen? And often people can be like that. Hallelujah. Second definition of evangelism is it can be defined, evangelism can be defined as the ability of a Christian to obey the Great Commission. The ability of a Christian to obey the Great Commission, which I have just read to you, which is going everywhere to make disciples for Jesus Christ. You're not making disciples for yourself. You're not making disciples for your church. You're not making disciples for any organization. You are making, ultimately, we are making disciples for Jesus Christ. And disciples are followers who are disciplined and following an instruction according to the word. That's why Jesus said we should teach them to what? Obey, not just to hear, but to obey. Hallelujah. Amen. And until you and I are in obedience to the word of God, we are not yet disciples. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. So James said, let us not be hearers only deceiving ourselves, but let us be what? Doers of the word of God. Amen? In other words, let us practice what we hear. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, quickly, quickly, I've got a lot of material, but um, so before I come to what type of evangelist are you, let me give you 12 reasons quickly because of, I know some of you will be discussing this in your small groups. So um, if you can catch all of them here, you can go and listen to them um, uh, after the message or after service on our channel on YouTube. By the way, if you are part of this church or you are watching me and you haven't subscribed to our channel, may I encourage you to do that. Why should we evangelize? Why is it important for you and I to evangelize? Number one, Jesus commanded us to evangelize. It's a command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. amen. And we, you and I need to obey his commands. Number two, the apostles commanded their followers, their, their, their churches, to be evangelists or to share the gospel. Have you ever come across people that uh, these days, in, in the past, you meet a parent who cannot wait to pull out their child's photograph or their grandchild's photograph, and whether you like it or not, you will watch it, especially when you are flying with them. You are stuck in this plane with them for the next six to seven hours, and you're going to have to go through all the albums with them. In other words, they are proud of what they have. They are relatives, and it gets a bit tiring when they pull out the, the pictures of their cats and dogs and guinea pigs and all that. They just want to just focus on the flight. In other words, they are proud of what they are showing to you. In other words, if you are, if you are proud of your faith, if you are grateful to God for your faith, then you cannot wait for the next person to hear. When the dispersion happened, we, we, we look at it not too long ago, when the dispersion happened in the Acts of Apostles, when they were, uh, um, um, after the death of Stephen, and when they dispersed, the Bible says that they went gossiping the gospel. Amen? It says, wherever they went, they preached the gospel. The word preached there, it, it means... A, a gossip. In other words, they were full of the gospel that they couldn't wait to share it with others. Someone say amen. And I pray that you and I will have that mindset and that attitude. Number three, through evangelism, many people will be encouraged because the gospel, because of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is good news. 
So number one, Jesus commanded us. Number two, the apostles commanded us. Number three, uh, uh, evangelism is a form of encouragement. It's a means by which God can transform our lives. Number four, evangelism is an opportunity to work directly with God. If you've never seen the power of God, you step out there on your own, pray, and see how God can use you. You say, Pastor, me, you try it in the name of Jesus Christ. Not telling people about yourself, but telling people about God. In other words, you become an ambassador of God, and if you do that, he will be behind you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Evangelism, number four, evangelism is an opportunity to work directly with God. Number five, it precedes baptism and salvation. Evangelism, true evangelism, effective evangelism precedes baptism, water baptism by immersion and by salvation. Number six, why it is important, evangelism is important. Number six, it proves our love for our Savior Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If I love God, if I love his son Jesus, then I cannot wait to tell others about him. Glory be to God. Amen? Amen. Glory be to God. Some people, as I, as I just stated not too long ago, when you meet them yesterday when the, when, when the coaches took off, uh, this uh, um, um, lady, an English white lady, as soon as the coaches took off, she started talking with me. And it was about her, her 11 children. I said, do you really mean that? She said that again. She said, she said, 11 children. And I'm looking at her, and she's about my age. In fact, I'm older than her. <laughs> you know, I'm older than her. And she tells me two of them have sadly passed away. Then it's, it's, it was about her mom. It was about her dad, her brothers that I don't know whether I'll ever meet them. She's just giving me her whole family history. From, the, from the, where the coaches were packed till we got to the, um, the traffic light, I had a whole encyclopedia of a family. That's fine. I didn't, I didn't matter. So when we got here, when we got to where I could just point to the church, I said, by the way, I'm the pastor. I'm the minister of this church. He said, I know you, pastor. <laughs> Praise the Lord. In other words, when you and I are full of the love of God, we cannot help but to tell others about Praise the Lord. Amen. And I'm coming on to that. Perhaps you are waiting. Oh, what type, of a, what type of an evangelist am I? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you some options, and you'll be able to identify what type of an evangelist are you. But let me go through why it is important for, the, for this week and next week. If it doesn't go beyond that, I don't know. But um, for, for the, today and next week, I'm just going to focus on the power of evangelism. And, and, and I've got these titles to share with you. So number six, it proves our love for our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Number seven, evangelism opens the, uh, opens the door for healing. Amen? Amen. For healing. And, 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 and uh, <laughs> other miracles. When we share the word of God with others, God is able to confirm his word um, when we have shared his word with others. So that's number seven. Evangelism opens doors for healing and miracles to the world as we go and preach and share our faith with number eight it is the gateway towards repentance and the remission of sins forgiveness of sins and so when you go don't go full of condemning people they, are, they already feel guilty anyway they already feel guilty so your job is to enable them to accept the love of God. That must be our primary message. The love of God. Not, 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 listen, the world feels condemned anyway. So going and saying believe or burn is not going to set them free. You talk about the weather. Oh, if you think it's so hot here, wait till you get to hell. Really? <laughs> I'm coming on to that. I'm coming on to different kinds of evangelists here, and you see which one you are. There are some people, they are confrontational evangelists. I'm going to come on to that in a moment. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So it is a gateway of repentance and remission of sins. Number nine, it brings understanding of the scriptures to humanity. Evangelism brings understanding of the scriptures to humanity. I know I'm moving on faster, but you can catch up as you do because I'm limited by time. So please do bear with me. Evangelism causes the Holy Spirit to move. You see Philip going to Samaria. 
when Simon the sorcerer was, and he was wowing the people with his magic until Philip came on the scene. And, and, and the Spirit of God was moving, and Simon himself got saved, although later on he was strictly, sternly told off when he offered money for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of God are free. I want to say that again. The gifts of God are what? Free. This is, this is as you know me, this is a passion of my heart to warn the, the, the congregation that God has given me, and anywhere I stand, the gifts of God are free. Never go to anyone who is selling you or telling you to pay them when they lay their hands on you too for you to get healing. Sadly, sadly, some, some people are going and they are buying oil. Why can't you get your own oil? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Bring it to me as your minister. I'll pray over it for you. It's just cosmetic, but God can use this to bring healing. Hallelujah. Amen. The gospel is free, and, and it brings understanding. Evangelism brings understanding of the scripture to humanity. And it causes, the evangelism causes the Holy Spirit to move, as we saw in Samaria when Philip was there. Remember that Philip was appointed as, an, as a deacon, and now he's regarded as an evangelist. Glory be to God. And so that's how God uses us. When we are faithful in one area, he asks unto us. Hallelujah. The, the evangelism is a fruit of righteousness. In other words, you yourself, your life got to be lived right. Just as I said not too long ago, you cannot say that, come to Jesus, but don't look at me. Of course, they shouldn't look at the ultimate view must go to Jesus Christ. But um, you have to be righteous, living right, your speech is right, your thoughts are right, your attitude and your lifestyle must be right. Someone say amen. amen. And finally, number 12, evangelism unites all nations. Evangelism unites all races. Evangelism unites all tribes and cultures by reconciling all humanity to God through Jesus Christ. And that's why I refer to what God has made us. The moment a particular tribe or nation begins to say, this is ours, I am out of here so quickly. Amen? The gospel is not for a particular group of people. The gospel is for everyone. That's why Jesus said, go to all nations. Is anyone listening? Yes. All nations. And all nations mean all nations, all tribes, all people. Of course, there are people who might be called to a particular group of people. But even that, you do not say, I do not preach to these people because uh, uh, um, they are not qualified or they are not entitled. That is not the gospel that I know. So who is an evangelist? Quickly, I've given you why it's important, 12 reasons why it's important for you and I to evangelize. So who is an evangelist? If, I, if I'm saying that, what type of an evangelist are you? Then it is right for me to ask you uh, the question, who is an evangelist? I've, give, I've got some three definitions here. The, uh, uh, the apostle told, apostle Paul told his son in ministry, do the work of an evangelist. We're talking about Timothy here. Paul said, do the work of an evangelist. So exactly what is an evangelist? Uh, the one who proclaims glad tidings. Another word for good news. Amen? Amen? Number two, in anyone who brings good news to another person is an evangelist. Glory be to God. So there's an element of good news. And I want us to get that very clear. Some people are often, uh, by their nature, the glass is half empty. And some of us, uh, the glass is half full. I want you to be the glass is half full when you go out evangeliz <laughs> evangelizing. Evangelist is a person who seeks to convert others to the Christian faith, especially by public preaching and by their, their right lifestyle and all, uh, and, and all that. So there's an element of proclamation I understand that someone has said, I don't know whether it was Francis of Assisi who said, preach the gospel by all means and if possible, use words. In other words, your lifestyle must also be preaching. Glory be to God. Every Christian has a certain style, every Christian. Someone say every Christian, including me. Shall we say that again? Including me. Amen. Hallelujah. Every Christian has a certain lifestyle when it comes to evangelism. 
Every Christian has a comfortable tone for discussing their faith with others. Some Christians are confrontational. I've used believe or burn, or wait till you get to hell, and all the rest of it, which is not uh, um, often recommended. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some Christians are more confrontational, while others are intellectuals. So even others are interpersonal, talking about friendship, evangelism, which I strongly believe in. While there is no one right way, Paul said he will be like all men in order to win some. Hallelujah. While there is no one right way to evangelize, you and I should know our style of evangelism. And so I'm going to give you the six before I come back to it because of the limitation of time. There are those who are confrontational evangelists. Some people are good at that. They are confrontational. That is their personality, and they get on with it. There are those who are intellectual evangelists. Number two, intellectual evangelists. There are those, number three, there are those who are testimonial evangelists. And by that, you understand that some, of, some people have got their testimonies, and when they share them, they win people through that. There are number four, there are those who are interpersonal evangelists. Interpersonal evangelists. There are those, number five, there are those who are invitational evangelists. Invitational evangelists. And there are those who are service evangelists. They serve in order to win souls. So let's come to the number one the confrontational evangelists. Are you the type that tends to confront people's fears, and, uh, 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 fears or objections directly when you evangelize? You see them in town, he said, are you a Christian? When was the last time you went to church? And before they could answer, you are bombarding them. Don't you know that the coming of the Lord is around the corner? <laughs> are your sins washed away? He said, what sins? <laughs> Amen? The story, of told, uh, the story is told about... Um, uh, a young lady that walked into the church, and a, an elderly gentleman was praying. And he was going, Lord, kill the flesh. Lord, kill the flesh. And the, the man's prayer was intense and seems very, very bold. So the young lady stood at the back and listened to this killing prayer. And she thought, Ooh, if they are into killing in this church, then what chance have I got? In other words, we've got to be very careful the Christian lingo that we might be used to that might not be friendly out there. So when you and I go and witness to the world, we've got to be able to tone down on what we are familiar with when it comes to the Christian gospel. I think when the, our old building was down, we were meeting everywhere, what, uh, especially the youth, the youth group. And I, I remember we met in Costa Coffee in Croydon once, and a young man that I had asked to share the gospel, every sentence was punctuated with hallelujah and amen, hallelujah and amen. No, I knew, I knew that's the way he spoke. So before he was introduced to speak, and this is Costa Coffee, with every, people just sitting there having their Costa, which I believe in. I love that. You know, taking the gospel into the marketplace. So before they introduced him, I put him aside and I said, would you be able to get rid of all the hallelujahs and the amens? He got so confused. And I said, did you hear me? And listen, he was full of the message. He was good. He did very well, but he didn't know how to take out the hallelujahs and the amens. <laughs> Amen? And he tried. He tried, but he couldn't get rid of it. And some people, I can give you stories after stories to do with how our Christian lingo can put people off and they don't know what we are talking about. Amen? Let's talk normal. Let's... Let's learn their language. Sometimes I'm listening to the youth, and I'm thinking, what are they talking about? And sometimes I tell myself, I better learn their language in order to be able to reach them. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Do, do many people tend to tell you that you are blunt when you discuss your faith? If so, then you are more like Peter. 
No, the apostle Peter or the disciple Peter. You know, he said it just as it should be said. And he got himself into a lot of trouble. Hallelujah. That was his style, very confrontational. Jesus, you are not going. You're not going to be killed. You know what I'm saying? And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Not too long ago, he had commended him. He said, upon your words, I will build my church. And not too long after that. So that was Peter for you. Asking direct questions and expecting direct responses. Hallelujah. And Jesus was also like that. He said, but what about you? Who do people say that I am? What about you? Yeah? So if that is you, there's, there's nothing wrong if, as long as you don't go offending people. God, there are certain people that the Holy Spirit will put in your way that you've got to let them hear it just as it is. Not all of us are put together that way. Some of us are more coming, and I'm going to come on to that in a moment. If you can give me, if possible, Acts chapter 17. We're going to look at Paul's skill of using intellectual evangelism here. Some Christians, and I've moved on from point number one, the confrontational evangelist, I'm now in point two. Some Christians might have an intellectual viewpoint. Some people are very good, and in Christian Evangelism or intrusion, how we call them, the apologists. They know how to answer difficult questions. Okay? And these people can be, they put things together. Uh, um, there's a man who has gone home to be with Jesus. Ravi Zacharias was one of the key proponents of sound uh, um, apologetics. I mean, I don't, I'm not into what you might have your opinion about him and what has been said about him since his death. But to me, he was a gifted man of God. Sound apologist. You put him in Cambridge, Yale, Princeton, all these top universities, and Ravi Zachariah will just, just dissect the word. Huge database of wisdom and intellectual way of reasoning, logic. So... There are people like that, they've studied and they know their stuff. Come from any angle and they'll come down to Jesus Christ with you. Hallelujah. Are you that type? If you are that type, don't apologize for it. Amen? We're going to see uh, uh, Paul's example in a moment. Uh, Paul was an apostle that also had that type of view on the world and he used it in his approach to evangelize. He had a way of using logic to evangelize, good reasoning, hallelujah. So let's come to uh, Acts chapter 17, as I've requested there. Acts 17, verse 16, and Paul is talking to the philosophers in Athens. I mean, if there were philosophers in the place, I mean, Greek philosophers. He says, now, and I'm using the New King James Version here, Mass. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked. I beg your pardon. Let me just use the um, New Living Translation. Sorry to be. Um, yes, Acts chapter 17. The New Living Translation. Just to bring it a bit of modern translation here. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. I mean, you and I should be troubled when we see that. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. Another thing that I want to say is that just because you got the gospel, just because you are eager to preach as him and everybody is going to accept you. Amen? That's why you and I must pray. Hallelujah. And he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. Daily. In other words, every morning he gets up or whenever he goes and he, 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 he looks for that opportunity. He also had a debate. Do you know how to debate? Learn to, how to debate. When you say something, allow others to come in. Listen to them. And when you are a good listener, you are able to pick up their, their, their weaknesses and you can use it to your advantage, to the glory of God. Someone say amen. amen. He had a debate with some of the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. These guys were not a joke. Amen? Let's learn to read and study and know our stuff. The people that I'm, not, I'm never afraid of them are the Jehovah's Witness people and the Mormons. Ah! Some people, when they say we are from, they shut the door. For me, if I have the time, I say, come on. 
You know why? I know their staff. I know their founder, Charles Russell. I know Joseph Smith. And when I begin to tell them about their founders, they begin to shake. I have studied the staff. Amen? So don't say, oh, I'm trusting the spirit. Yes, I want to trust the spirit as well, but I learn as, as well. Amen. Glory be to God. So when, I, when they come and, and I listen to them, when they bring um, eschatology, which is the study of the end times, I'm, I'm ready for them. And I say, as long as we are basing our discussion on the word of God, let's agree on that. There was a couple of them that I used to um, welcome in my home, and I, I, I often say to them, this week you, you choose your subject, next week I'll choose my subject. They stopped coming when I chose the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Folks, let's depend on the Spirit of God by all means, but let us also learn. Let's find time to read and educate ourselves. And God, listen, that is the reason why the Spirit of God and God Almighty used Paul to write the majority of the New Testament. Amen? God, he has studied. Yes, he persecuted the church. But didn't Jesus say that he will suffer for my cause? Because he knew what was in Paul. Glory be to God. They saw the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers are here. When he told them, when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, What's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said, He seemed to be preaching about some foreign gods. Remember that these people are surrounded with idols. Amen? Verse 19. Then they took him to the high council of the city. When you and I are faithful, God will place us in places that will shock us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, he said, come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the, foreign, the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. Glory be to God. Verse 22. So Paul, standing before the council, what an opportunity. Now you and I will mess up such an opportunity when we are not prepared. Amen? Amen? What an opportunity. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of our things. It's like, uh, it's like Mac uh, Mac Anthony's speech in Shakespeare. <laughs> you know. Um, men of our things. I notice, look at the wisdom and the style, the craft that this man has in him. This is not a time that he has really prepared a three-point sermon here. It's all coming because he knew it. God has deposited that in him. Men of our things. I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your authors had this inscription on it. This is beautiful. To an unknown God. To an unknown God. To this God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. <laughs> he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in a man-made temples, and human hands can serve his needs, for he has no needs. What a, what a powerful sermon and evangelism here. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations through the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of you, some of your own poets have said, so Paul had read, he had learned, he knows their poets, he knows their quotes, he's speaking their language, he's working, you can see that he's working on their minds. Glory be to God. 
So he said, for in him we live. The, you see, you have created these idols and these shrines. But he said, in the God that I'm talking about, the unknown God that you have in your inscription here, this is the one I'm speaking to. And he's just working on their emotions and their intellect. and their... Look at that. When you go home, find time to read this through. And you just enjoy, just as I'm enjoying it, preaching it to you. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these sins in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent. And they are hearing this word, repent. Repent. It should be strange to them, but they are hearing it. Everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man. Then he mentioned Jesus here. Oh, what a craftsman in his oratory. Glory be to God. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I just love this language here. And that is an, an intellectual evangelist. Using the things around people and applying it to their own selves and by so doing, elevating Jesus Christ. Only through him, you and I can be saved. Someone say amen. Amen. And so there are people who are like that. If you are like that, that's fine. You know, if you are not like that, that other, uh, the other stars might be your star. But I love that. When I, as I said, when I get these people, when they, when they come knocking on my door, oh, I say, come on. You know, Hare Krishnas. You know, all these Eastern Back in 1984, I am back on a course called Philosophies of <laughs> um, Fraud. And I learned about Hare Krishnas and all these people, you know, and I've now forgotten that. I'm always willing and ready to engage with them. That might not be your star. Someone said to me, Pastor, when I open the door to them, what must I do? I said, if you cannot argue with them, share your testimony with them. He said, wow, I've never thought about that. And that young man is still practicing that. And so there are those, that leads, to, that leads me to my next point. There are those who have got powerful testimony. In fact, the young man who asked me that question, he's, he's no longer a young man. I, I call him a young man, but he's not that, that, that young. He was on drugs for a long time. It messed up his marriage. It messed up his career. It so, listen, it, it, he was just a mess. Christ has picked him up in this church. He's cleaned him up for over 20, 25 years. He's just a born-again Christian. So I, I said to him, when you don't know what to say, when you open the door to Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons and all that, they will come in with their line of doctrine. They've taught them in their worship places what to say and the answers they should expect. So you, you have a testimony. I often remind him of his testimony. I said, I know when you came in and how your life was a mess. His wife had left him and rightfully so because he was just on drugs. He was in bondage true drugs. And, um, and so I said, give them your testimony. Like the, the blind man in John chapter 9, <laughs> he said, well, I knew that I was blind. Now I can see. No one can tell me that I wasn't. Amen? And they even called his parents in. Is this your son? How come you can see? And I said, wow. As for knowing that he's our son, we know he's our son. As for how he became, <laughs> his eyes got open. We don't know. How do you argue against that? And you and I have testimonies, don't we? Yes. And our testimonies are our like um, something that no one can take away from us. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. I know who I was. You can't say, some, some of my classmates will often say, wow, we thought he was religious, you know. And we are happy. We are happy that he's doing something that we always knew. They, they know my testimony. I just know my, but I also know my testimony. I know where I'm from. I know the life that God has pulled me out from. I know the family that God has pulled me out from. How I can sit my, with my Muslim relatives. And just by the grace of God, I could have been 
praying five times a day in a mosque. My maternal grandfather, a Muslim, some of my Muslim relatives have been in this church, you know that. And so, how, how do you challenge that? I know that I know that I know where God has pulled me from. Glory be to God. So, some of us are testimonial evangelists. Okay, so number one, confrontational evangelist. Number two, intellectual evangelist. Number three, testimonial evangelist. Number four, interpersonal evangelist. Some Christians prefer witnessing individually. You know, we've been praying on the prayer line that God will give us people to, be, to, to, to lead to Christ by the end of the year. Who are you praying for? I know in your cell group program, during the prayer times, you are supposed to come up with someone's name. Have you got a neighbor, a friend, a work colleague who's, who, who you are praying for? for? Folks, if you are not that intentional, it's not going to happen. But it's such a beautiful thing when you pray and pray and pray for someone and their lives get changed. When you have targeted... Let me tell you those people who do that. The people that you might know or you might not know who do that are the drug dealers. They don't, yes. They don't, just, they don't just meet someone. They see that young man. And they often target young men from single parent families. I've got a testimony here on my device. Um, a journalist. I don't think he was confronting this drug dealer. And the drug dealer was so confident of what he's doing. He said, we know, we watch them, and they often give them money, give these young people money. They start them, and that's why as parents, we've got to watch our children. The fact that they've gone to uni doesn't mean that they are adults. You and I need to visit them. You and I need to love them. You and I need to check their friendship groups. Last night, I listened to a, a terrible testimony. Well, this girl that went to uni in Ghana and sharing a, a room or an accommodation with three other girls. It was through those three other girls, true story. It was through those three other girls that she became a prostitute on campus because they were earning money and they were looking after her. And before long, they told her, this is how they introduced They said, you got to make good use of what you have in order to get what you want on a university campus. And her first attempt, money that she's never seen. Her mom was a charcoal seller. The first time she went to practice that prostitution, the man gave her $200, money that she's never seen. Sooner or later, she was able to move her mom from charcoal selling business to a shop, build her mom a kiosk where she put provisions in there. You and I need to open our eyes who our children are being. So I'm talking about personal or interpersonal evangelists. That's what I call friendship evangelism. I mean, the negative side is what I've just told you. When those three girls got her into that business, they were there for academic fulfillment, academic achievement, but they were, they were also into other businesses. But you and I need to turn that around. Amen? Befriend that neighbor. Next week, I'll tell you how to do that. You're going to start by at least a smile. Some of us are too serious. We are too serious Christians. This morning, as you are coming, I wonder, listen, sometimes our neighbors are watching us. Oh, I'm going to church. <laughs> <laughs> and they are trying to get your attention. Hello, Mr. Gospel man. I'm here. Would you invite me? Talking about the Mormons, they will come to your home. If you want them to do your grocery shopping for you, they will do it. If you want them to mop for you, they will mop. Oh, yes. Interpersonal evangelism. They will do all for, for them to share what they call the gospel, which I don't call the gospel. Amen? I don't call the gospel. So let's make the effort. Glory be to God. Interpersonal evangelism. Get to know people. How do people view you in your place of employment? Do they see you as the one who is always avoiding them? I'm not saying that when they say, come on, let's go to the bar and uh, just download a lot of alcohol and all that. No, no, no. They should respect you enough. Your, your testimony must be clear. But don't, don't disassociate yourself as if you are holier than them. 
Get to know their name. Get to know their birthdays. Get to know their children. I was talking with someone on Friday, and names were rolling off my tongue. It is a, it is a, a ministerial friend, an Ely minister. And I'm pointing things out to him, to her, and this and that. He said, wow, you've been gifted with remembering names. All oh, these, oh, hello, brother. Hello, my friend, this. You try and remember their name. And you feel, ah, oh, so this person remembers me. Amen? Interpersonal. Very, very powerful. Amen? The invitational evangelist, number five. Both the Samaritan woman and Levi were examples of those who invited people to meet Christ. That woman, when she was told her story, just took off from the world. And she said, come and see the man who has told me everything about myself. And Levi was the one that invited people to his home. Some Christians take this approach by inviting friends and uh, uh, um, family to the church services. And I love that. Some of us, too, are not that very good with that. But whatever it is, be hospitable. Be hospitable. Cook for others. Social. Take them out for a meal. Amen. You yourself, perhaps you haven't been to a restaurant for years. When I took the church to Valley Park, to, um, to the cinema hall, a number of you said to me, that's the first time you've entered into a cinema theater. Yes. What is that? Why, guys? I know where some of you are coming from. It's as if when you enter into a cinema hall, you committed on part number sin. Really? We worship there for a year. Does it mean that we sinned? Hey. <laughs> Be an invitational evangelist like Levi and, and the woman of Samaria. Let me give you the last one before we go. Time is fast spent. Be a service evangelist, just as I've mentioned um, the Mormons. While some Christians take more direct evangelistic approach, others prefer to be examples of Christ through service. Dorcas, uh, her other name was um, Tabitha. She, she, she used her hands, weaving things. Some of you are like that. Some of you are good. You know, are those who will take care of my teeth, my hair, my, my hairdo, my clothing. I'm really blessed, you know. <laughs> you know, there are people who just want to, it's like, Pastor, give us an opportunity to serve. And by doing that, they are attracting people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 9, verse 30, it says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, who was always doing good and helping the poor. Amen. Tabitha was always doing good, and when she died, they brought Peter in who prayed for her, and she came back to life. If you, are not, if you and I are not here today, what will people say to, about us when it comes to our generosity, our service in ministry? I always thank God when I'm invited to people's parties and events, when I go there and I'm giving my peace, I'm able to say this person is part of the worship team, this person is a cell leader, this person is a, um, a technical team. I, I, I love that. And I talk about our rewards in heaven, which will depend on our service on earth. So now, you know what, what type of an evangelist you are? Anyone who knows what type of evangelist they are? Oh, Pastor, I'm not sure. <laughs> Amen? Are you a confrontational type? <laughs> Someone has admitted. Are you an invitational type? Are you the service type? You are always willing to serve and making things for people that are those who are making cakes and um, wanting an opportunity to serve. Intellectual type, and so on and so forth. Next week, we'll learn the how-to. Would you like to stand? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Your word has gone forth, and it shall not return to you void. Would you make this word clear to us? Clear, clear to us. Give us opportunities to practice what type of evangelist we might be, especially this week making the effort to invite young and old to you, knowing your word for ourselves. Thank you. So Holy Spirit, come. Let your anointing overwhelm us. We cannot do anything without your enablement, without your power, without your grace. Whether we are riding on a bus 
or traveling by air, by train, by sea, however we are traveling, however we are working, Father, may your grace be upon us. In our interactions, in our conversations, give us the right words, O oh God. Give us ideas. May the gifts of the Holy Spirit be abundant in us and around us as we seek to win others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. As we leave this place, we are not leaving your presence. Your presence will go with us and abide with us until we meet again. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and always. Amen? Amen. Give glory to God before you go. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.